politics, but I do miss the students. They were delightful and brilliant at Davidson, and many of them became lifelong friends. I started making art pretty much full time when I was 12 years old. My sister, who may come this morning, if she does, she's tall and looks sort of like me, so you'll know when she walks in. <laughs> she doesn't have a beard, though. <laughs> she's four years older, and uh, she was very skilled at rendering. Rendering meaning drawing what you see, or drawing something from uh, another artist, for example, copying a little master or whatever. And my father used to be very impressed by this, and he would say, Mary Ruth can put the shadows right where they should be. So I thought, uh, naively, that if I could be better than she was, he would be impressed by me also. That did not turn out to be the case. However, I did over time become enough better than she was that uh, she quit and gave me all her supplies, which was the exciting. Uh, and even though my father wasn't impressed, other people were. And so I began producing artwork steadily in my studio at the age of 12. Now, she in her later life uh, has gone back to painting. She does watercolor. And so I'm so happy that, that uh, I didn't stunt her growth forever. <laughs> she's, she's quite accomplished as a watercolor painter. And I don't use watercolor, so we still have our separate domain. Uh, I started out, people always are interested whether I always was an abstract artist. And we could get into a long discussion about how I feel all art is abstract, but that's really not the point. As a young guy, I did what I thought I was supposed to do, which was to do landscape still lives. People, um, and at a certain point, probably two or three years into it, I felt uh, limited by because frankly, that's, at least in my opinion, not so challenging to represent what is out there in the world with the stress on the reef, because it's already out there in the world. I'm more interested in presenting something that is not really already there, and also something that I don't know, because if I know it, I've already done it in a certain way. People often ask me, do I do it? plan for a painting. Do I know where a painting is going to go? And the answer is absolutely not. I don't want to know. I want to be lost until about the last 5%. And then the painting starts to find me, and I find it. And we have a very comfortable relationship for the last week or so. But initially, I'm completely lost. I have no idea where it's going. What that provides for me is the excitement of discovery, which I hope people who ultimately have the work can feel on a daily basis that somehow it's in the work, that uh, feeling of wonder that I feel when I'm, when I'm working. Anyway, back to when I was young, uh, my first ventures into abstraction were pretty bad, uh, as you might expect, but slowly but surely I found my footing and over the years uh, went through various phases, uh, all of which are documented in a book back there called Excavation. So if you're interested to see uh, the first painting that's in the book when I was 16, the book is chronological and it carries you up to now. Very important aspect of my beginnings, and I'll try to condense it as much as I can, I was very interested in digging, that is I thought I wanted to be an archaeologist. And so I used to dig in a clay bank and find what was other people's trash, really, but broken pottery shards and so forth, which I thought were wondrous objects. And then, somewhere around third grade, and you may remember doing this too, we had, we didn't have a standard art teacher that came or was there all the time, but we had sort of a circuit rider art teacher who would come every few weeks. And one day, this particular art teacher said, we're going to coat all of our paper with colored crayons any way you want, just make all the colors, and then we're gonna cover it with a black crayon. And then when you do that, here's a paper clip, or I don't remember whether it was a nail or 
what it scratched through. Well, for me, this brought it all together, the digging, the archaeology, the discovery, and essentially it's what I'm still doing. Each layer that uh, I put on is immediately taken back off. So I work, I work about a square inch at a time. If I didn't do that, because I work in acrylic, it would dry, it would cure, if you want to call it that, and then I couldn't get it off at all. That's the beauty of acrylic, it's very permanent. But while it's still wet, I can carve into it, remove it, and so it's important to understand that if I didn't do that, this painting would be out to here, because there are 100 layers more. Mm -hmm. And I would have to work on rigid support, meaning masonite or plywood. I like to work, at least in acrylic, on something that gives, that has a, a life like a human being. And so carving back allows me several possibilities. One, to be able to do that, because the canvas couldn't hold that much paint if I was building way up. And also to discover the shapes and marks and things that are going to determine the future of the painting as I do straight from back. Once there's a shape I'm interested in, uh, it'll be protected. So if you get up close, you'll see that I have worked up to it and left it at least for a period of time. There are other shapes like this buried in here that you would never see. So shapes don't have, they don't have a license for being until they're near the end. And if they're still around near the end, chances are they're going to stay. But many come and go as the process takes place. I put pumice in the paint, volcanic ash. So, bless Mount St. Helens on some level, <laughs> <laughs> creating an endless supply of pumice. And the interesting thing is that pumice is mostly used as an industrial abrasive. It's not an art product, typically. And so when I'm working with my knives and things with pumice, they become exceedingly sharp. I find out from time to time when I go to clean them. <laughs> but the sharpness also allows me an edge to draw into the surface. So people sometimes ask me why do I make these marks, these drawings, into the surface. And there are two reasons. One, I want to always remind the viewer that this is a painting. It's not an illusion. That's why I'm not a landscape painter. They, they've been referred to as psychological landscapes, but they're not landscapes in the sense that I want you to say, oh, there's the mountain, there's the tree. And so this brings you back to the fact that it's a surface, it's a painting, it's a thing made by him. Uh, the second thing is I want a painting to do something that, for me, certain paintings do not do when I go into a museum, and that is at 20, 30 feet, I'm impressed, I'm moved, I get up close and I'm left wanting. A perfect example for me is George O'Keefe, who at a distance I think is a knockout painter. When I get up really close, I feel cheated because I don't know whether it's just she preferred extremely uh, parsimonious use of paint or whether she needed to say paint or what, but they're <coughs> kind of thin and not really rich up close. In a book she looks great. What I want is the painting to have power and presence at a distance, and then when you get up to it, you don't have to put a couch in front of it to keep your friends away. When you get up to it, you actually discover new things that you can't see at 15 or 20 feet, and that's where the drawing comes in. The other thing I'm very interested in is, is relationships and dynamics within the surface, so that if you're living with one of these paintings, I don't want you to ever completely see it. I want it to change in the sense that one day you go, oh, I didn't realize this speaks to that in quite that way. And that's the way I like to look at paintings. I don't want to walk by them like they're furniture in my house. The other thing that might interest you is I use mica, which comes from the North Carolina mica mine in Burnsville, so not far from here. I use sand from Sunset Beach and also still have some from Harvey Littleton's glass shop before it closed down. 
I don't use it too much because it's very dangerous. It's so fine that any of it in the air, if you breathe it in, you're in, in trouble. So I wear a mask, but the sand from Sunset Beach I use partly because we love Sunset Beach. And also I like the surface that it creates. And other materials, for example, in this one there's garnet. I just like natural materials. And it goes back to the digging in the dirt and the earth. The oil crayon drawings, some people ask me what is oil crayon. If you're an artist, you probably have heard of it as oil pastel. I'm very <coughs> stubborn. I won't use the term oil pastel except to explain that I won't use the term oil pastel. <laughs> and the reason is I used to do pastel portraits. And pastel is a very powdery, chalky material. If you blow on a pastel, you're going to get dust, even the Degas. If you go to the museum in, in Paris and see the Degas, the pastel is still coming down to the bottom of the mat and will probably forever. And that's just the nature of pastel, but this material has enough oil and wax in it that it's really, in my opinion, a crayon. I think it just wasn't called oil crayon because that didn't sound sexy, and they wanted to sell it to people, you know, pastel. But it's a crayon. When you touch it, it feels like a crayon. And so when you, I have, there's several books back there that you can see that refer to it. I call them oil crayons. But they are, in the commercial sense, if you go to a store, oil pastel. They're built up, uh, and they're more, here's some. They're built up in 30 or 40 or 50 layers. They don't get quite as far as, as the paintings, as far as the amount of layering. But the scraping back is the same philosophy. It's still the same digging, discovering process. It's just a different material. The third thing in this show that's uh, a different material are these ones on birch panel. Now in a way that's kind of a contradiction because I told you I